In this video, I'm going to build a little bit of intuition about phase synchronization, and I will also introduce something about the neuroscience theory that motivates the use of phase synchronization as a measure of brain connectivity. But let me actually begin by talking about terminology. Unfortunately, there are many names in the literature that are used for the same underlying concept. So the concept is that we are looking at a clustering of phase angle differences between two different electrodes. And you will see various terms in the literature, in the publication literature, that all refer to exactly the same procedure, exactly the same formula. Now, I find this unfortunate and confusing, but that is just how it is. This is also not an exhaustive list. You will also see other terms in literature that are still used for the same uh, operation, the same thing. I'm going to be calling it intersite phase clustering because that is the closest term that I can find to the actual analysis that is being implemented. And in my opinion, terminology, so the names that we give for analyses, should be as close as possible to the mathematical operation that we are applying and should not be confused with the biological or psychological or scientific inferences that we would like to use that measure to make about brain function. Okay, anyway, so with that in mind, let me now switch to a little bit of brain theory. So what this diagram is depicting is an action potential, and in particular, the membrane potential of, a, uh, of an individual neuron. So if you would measure the membrane voltage potential from uh, the membrane of a neuron relative to the extracellular fluid somewhere else, you would find that it has a resting negative threshold like this. And then as the neuron is being bombarded by excitatory inputs and inhibitory inputs, eventually the level of electrical excitation, the electrical activity inside the cell in the dendrites in the perisomatic region will exceed some threshold. So the excitation increases and that will elicit this cascade of electrical and chemical events that is called an action potential. So there's a strong depolarization and then you get a repolarization and there's this hyperpolarization period here. And this is all very fast. This is really just a couple of milliseconds here, this action potential. Now in this diagram, it looks like the membrane is totally flat before the action potential. However, this is just a simplification and this is only showing like two milliseconds here. This is just two milliseconds. If you would do a recording like this from an actual neuron and you would record for longer periods of time, you would look back longer in time, you would see that the membrane potential is actually not flat. It's fluctuating up and down. It is getting depolarized and hyperpolarized, but not to the level of an action potential until there is an actual action potential. So here you see some examples of real data. So these are the membrane potentials from real neurons. And you can see that over time, now this time scale is seconds. So this is huge compared to this time scale of milliseconds. So you can see over time, the membrane potential is increasing. So the neuron is relatively depolarized. It's decreasing, the uh, neuron becomes relatively hyperpolarized and so on. Here, this spike here, these spikes, these are action potentials. So this one spike, which is like one pixel here on the screen, this is all of this business, but zoomed out to a much longer time scale. So what you see is that neurons uh, change in their dynamics between being depolarized when an action potential is more likely because they are closer to threshold and being hyperpolarized when an action potential is less likely because the membrane potential is somewhere all the way down here. So it's harder for the neuron to get up to threshold. So here you see two different neurons from the same recording. And here you see the LFP. So you see that these membrane potential fluctuations that are consistent across a population of neurons is also reflected in the LFP. So you see that when the membrane potential goes down, the LFP goes up. Now, the phase of the LFP, if you are measuring really close to the neurons, is going to be opposite because this is reflecting the intracellular potential and this is reflecting the extracellular potential. So as ions are flowing into the neuron, they're necessarily coming from somewhere. So they're coming from the extracellular fluid, which is where the LFP is coming from. Now, the exact phase of the LFP is actually difficult to interpret for a variety of reasons. And that's because if you're measuring the LFP from the other side of the dipole, 
of these neurons. If these neurons are oriented in such a way that they're forming a dipole, the LFP on one side of the dipole would go up when these go down, and the LFP on the other side of the dipole would go down when these guys go down. Okay, now these recordings here are taken from deep sleep. Now, it's not always the case that you see such stark differences between these what are called upstates and downstates. This uh, sharp distinction between upstates and downstates is generally what you see during deep sleep and anesthesia and uh, other conditions like that where your brain isn't really conscious and actively doing something. During the awake state, it's a lot more complicated. You see a lot more fluctuations, but still the point is when your brain is active, these neurons do not have a flat resting membrane potential. They have a membrane potential that is going up and down and it's alternating between periods of depolarization when action potentials are more likely and hyperpolarization when action potentials are less likely to occur. Now, this phenomenon is well known for a long time, and it inspired theories going back into the 19th century. Since the late, 19, uh, the late 1800s, scientists have hypothesized that these fluctuations in the electrical activity of neurons and populations of neurons are related to the mechanism of communicating or signaling information across different neural populations. So here you see an example of one of these theories that has uh, developed from, you know, almost 150 years now of neuroscience thinking. And so the idea is that, so these circles represent populations of cells, not necessarily an individual cell. So if you have two populations of cells that are oscillating in synchrony like this with the same phase, then when they have action potentials, those are easy to transmit across these two different populations of cells. So this facilitates, this synchronization, in-phase synchronization, facilitates the exchange of information like this because these action potentials here, when they are transmitted to uh, the neurons in this population, then these neurons are already in their depolarized state, so they are more likely to el elicit uh, an action potential. Now, this population, in contrast, is synchronous with antiphase. So if two uh, populations of neurons are either antiphase synchronous or if they are just not synchronized at all, then action potentials from this population will impinge on these neurons, but it will be to no avail. Nothing will happen because these neurons are in their hyperpolarized state. And when the neuron is in the hyperpolarized state, it's just less likely to emit an action potential because your, the neuron is much further away from its membrane threshold to create this action potential. Okay, so that's a very, very quick overview of the idea that motivates phase-based synchronization. So the idea is that you measure a population of cells and the electrical activity that you will record is strongly rhythmic. It is uh, has some rhythmic features or oscillatory features, and that's, of course, the main motivation for doing spectral analyses and time frequency analyses. And then the idea is you measure two populations of cells, and here is the, the key inference. If the electrical activities from these two populations are synchronous, if their timing is consistent like this, then we infer that these two populations of cells are functionally connected to each other. They are transmitting information back and forth. They're working together on the, to process the same information. There is connectivity, functional connectivity, between these two populations. Okay, so that's enough of brain theory. What I want to do now is build a little bit of intuition for phase synchronization in general. So one important thing to understand about phase synchronization is that we care about the timing, not about the amplitude. So in these two time series with these two signals, this window of time here reflects strong synchronization because the two groups of cells or these two time series are going up and down together. The phases are consistent between these two. So when we are computing phase synchronization, we will be ignoring the amplitude value altogether and only focusing on the phase angle time series. And you'll learn about that in the next video when I talk about the formula for phase synchronization. So again, the idea is that the timing is important, the amplitude is completely ignored. And of course, you always have to keep in the back of your mind this relationship between amplitude and phase that I discussed several times. I discussed it 
uh, first in the spectral section about the Fourier transform and estimating phase values. And then I also talked about it in the section on uh, wavelet convolution and extracting phase. So the idea there was that phase and amplitude are totally independent of each other, except when amplitude is really, really small and phase is undefined, or when amplitude is actually zero, then phase is just not defined. Okay, so timing is important, not amplitude. Another key point is that we are interested in the consistency of the phase difference, the phase differences between two different electrodes, two time series, and not the actual phase itself. So for example, here you see phase synchronization, and in this time window, you also see strong phase synchronization. Now this is anti-phase synchronization. They are going, you know, one goes up and the other one goes down. So they are anti-correlated. That can be important, that can be relevant. Relative phase is interesting to interpret. In fact, there are entire measures of synchronization, alternative measures of synchronization that are based on the relative phase. But for standard phase synchronization, for phase clustering based measures, what we are interested in is whether the phase difference is consistent over time between these two time series, these two electrodes. Again, you will see more about why that is and how that manifests in the equations for phase synchronization in the next video. All right, and then the third point is that synchronization, particularly in the brain, is dynamic over time. So you can have periods, time periods, where there is no synchronization, and then, you know, some number of cycles later, a little bit of time later, so here there's no synchronization, and then the brain can suddenly go into a regime where there is synchronization. So no synchronization followed by synchronization. And in general, the mechanism of these uh, time varying changes in synchronization are subtle changes in frequency. So changes in frequency is one mechanism to change the timing of the phase values. And you can also see that in this example. So this blue line here is uh, fluctuating slower than the green line. And here, then it, you know, it kind of speeds up a bit. And here they are fluctuating at the same speed. So time series can go in and out of synchronization dynamically over time according to changes in frequency. Obviously for the brain, this is really important because changes in synchronization over time will reflect neural populations that go in and out of communication. All right, so I hope that in this video, you gain some intuition about phase synchronization and the idea of phase synchronization. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about the formula and how to actually quantify phase synchronization and really awesome spoiler alert, you already know everything you need to know about how to compute phase synchronization. You just need to see it in context and you will get that you already know the formula for this.